this this is the equation as, as we said uh, in the previous class this is Schrodinger equation in one dimension and it's the governing equation in quantum mechanics this is the mass of the particle this is the potential scalar potential that comes from the force okay and what we need to obtain is this wave function which is a function of x position as well as time okay and this function together with its complex conjugate this product gives us the probability of finding the particle in some location okay so this is the governing equation for wave mechanics or quantum mechanics. How do we solve this partial differential equation? We will do that in, in one dimension, only in the x coordinates. We assume motion in the x direction. We have learned in math, that's the easiest way to approach partial differential equations is to try first the method of separation of variables. So here is my wave function, epsi, capital epsi. I'm going to write it as a small epsi, okay, which is only a function of x times a small phi or phi, which is a function of time t. So it's a product of two functions. One, a function of time. The other one is a function of position. This is how we separate the variables. Okay? So, if psi x is the wave function component that depends on position x, and um, phi or phi t is the time-dependent component of position and an uh, independent of position. Now, when we apply the method of separation of variables, that is to say, we take this product and substitute it back in Schrodinger equation. And it's a partial differentiation. So, the differentiation with respect to x will only act on psi, and the differentiation with respect to time will only act on phi. So, by doing the differentiation and moving the variables or the functions to either side of the two equations, we get an entirely function of x on the left-hand side and an entirely function of time on the right-hand side. So that's how we separate the variables. We substitute this product in Schrodinger equation. And then we separate x's, you know, functions of x on one side and functions of time on the other side. And then we say, since on the left-hand side we have only function of x, and on the right-hand side we have only function of time, then each side must be equal to a constant. And this constant, E, should be independent of both time and position. So, this is how we do solution. This is the technique for solution of partial differential equations using the separation of variables method. So, separate the variables x and t, and then set each side equal to the same constant e. So, e is independent of x and t. Okay? Therefore, instead of only one equation, now we have two equations. We have this equation and we have this equation so let us focus first on this equation so this equation is simply here i h bar d phi by dt is equal to so what i did is i moved i h to this side right so and i tried to move i to the top so this is, this is what we get here. Okay, so i h bar d phi by dt is minus i 
e over h bar phi. Okay, so dividing by i h bar phi, I don't think this is right. This should go. This should be away. Away. Okay. So this is what we get. Okay. From this side, this is the equation we get. Why did we change from delta, which is a partial derivative, to a complete derivative? Because it doesn't matter now, since phi is only a function of time. So, a complete differential or derivative, or a partial derivative, is the same on a function that is only a function of time. So, that's why it's d phi by dt, or d phi by dt, is equal to minus e over h bar phi. Now, this solution, this equation, is a first-order differential equation, and the solution is pretty straightforward. It's actually an exponential of this exponent here. So, phi of t is proportional to, or equal to a constant, times e minus i e over h bar t. So, this is phi of t. That is the time-dependent part of the solution. Okay. Now, observe one thing. This time-dependent part has nothing to do with the force or with the potential. The potential does not show up in the equation for the time-dependent part. So, this part is independent of the forces. Okay? And therefore, this part should be the same in any problem when we solve in quantum mechanics, no matter what force do we have. It's always the time independent, the time dependent part is phi of t goes as exponential minus i e over h bar t. This is very important. So, then that says epsi of x, capital epsi of x, the wave function, is equal to the, the position-dependent part, which is a small epsi of x, times this part, which is always, which is phi of t, which is always like this, independent of, of the force. The parameter e, which we chose for the separation of variable, which is independent of x and t, has the dimension of energy. Why do I say it has a dimension of energy? Because h bar, what's the unit of h bar? h bar is energy, say joule, right? Uh, joule, say, uh, per second. Okay? Say joule per second, that's h bar. So T is in second. Okay, so E, which is, uh, which is in this case, uh, the same as uh, T uh, 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 H bar T. What's H bar T? That is going to be joule, which would be the units of E. So, the units of E, E looks like its energy unit. So, it may have a physical significance, physical importance, but we will see that later. Okay? Now, let's look at the probability distribution function. We said the wave function only is meaningful when we multiply it by its complex conjugate. And so, the complex conjugate, it would be the complex conjugate of a small psi times the complex conjugate of this function here. What's the complex conjugate of this function? We change minus i to plus i. So, we get this. And then times a psi, which is a psi of x, times the function. So, you immediately see that these two functions cancel out. And what you get is that the probability distribution function, which has the physical meaning, is only a function of x. It actually only comes from 
the position dependent part of the wave function. So the position dependent part of the wave function is very important. It tells us about the location of the particle. Okay, so we really need to solve Schrodinger equation or the remaining part after we separate the variables and find this is small if psi of x. And this is the remaining part after we separate the variables. So this is the second differential equation. It's a second order differential equation. But most importantly, it has u of x. That means it has the force, the signature of the force. So the, what type of force is very important in determining this is small epsi. This is small epsi varies with the force. Also, we see that this E parameter, which we use to separate the variables, is there. Now, this, I'm writing it here as a partial differential equation, but you know it could be written as a full second order differential equation, as a full differential. Why? Because this is all a function of x, so we don't need to use differential, uh, partial differentials. We can use complete differentials. Okay, so this is the equation to solve. Always we will try to solve this equation for different potential. So we put in different potential, different particles of different mass, and then we solve this equation to find this E and to find this Epsi so that we can use this Epsi back here to get the location or the probability of the location. Okay? Now, let's take an example. Let's go back and look at the parameter E. We said it has the uh, energy uh, dimension. So, it must be energy. But is it energy? So, to do this, let us consider a simple case where ux, the potential of a force, is zero, is, is constant, u0. So, if we say that the potential is constant everywhere, then what does that mean? It simply means that the force is zero. There is no force. Constant potential meaning there is no force. Now, if you go back to the revisions that I made at the beginning on classical mechanics, we said that we can always obtain the, obtain the force F from the potential, scalar potential, by doing grad the scalar potential, U of X or V of X. So the grad of the scalar potential minus equals the force. That's the relation. But if the scalar potential is constant, then the grad of a constant potential okay, is equal to zero. So if we take uh, an electron or a particle, with constant potential, then that means there is no force. There is a zero force acting on this particle. So if this particle is moving, then its total, uh, 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 if, you, if you have u naught as a constant, a very simple solution to the Schrodinger equation, which is this one here. Let me clean it for you. A very simple solution is of the form Epsi of x equals to some constant a times e i times some constant k times x. If I try this solution here, you will find out that it satisfied the solution, okay? 
and it satisfies the solution such that p squared over 2m plus u naught equals e. So if you substitute that solution, you will find this. Why do we say p squared? Because what we find is uh, p is equal to h bar k. So if we put p, so p squared is h squared k squared. Remember, when we talked about de Broglie, we said this k is a wave number, and this wave, wave number relates to the momentum p, right? That is p equals h bar k. So this, co this constant or this parameter here, we chose here, when we substitute it in this equation, behaves as if it's the wave number, as if it's p. And so what we get for this to satisfy the equation is that p squared over 2m plus u naught equals e, where p squared is simply h squared k squared. But p squared over 2m, if we think in terms of classical dynamics, p, the momentum, is equal to mv. Right? So p squared over 2m is the same as half mv squared. So that's the kinetic energy of the particle. So this term here is the kinetic energy of the particle. And u naught is the potential, even though it's constant, but it's a constant potential energy. It's a potential energy of the particle. So kinetic energy plus potential energy equal to this separation of variable constant E. So this constant E must be the total energy of the particle. So this E is very important, you know, which we get out of the equation. This E is actually the energy of the particle. So, U is the potential of the force, but then E, which we get out of solution of this equation, this E gives us the energy of the particle. And this function here gives us the position-dependent part of the wave function. And it actually gives us the probability distribution function. So, solving the position dependent uh, partial differential equation is very important because it immediately gives us so much information on the location of the particle and gives us also information on the energy of the particle. So, now Things are getting clear. Now, here is exactly, you know, the plotting of E versus K, because K now is our wave number, and we have second order dependence on K. So this is a parabola equation, and this gives you the energy of our particle as a function of K. And it's continuous energy. So you have all the energies possible for the particle, covering all this curve, so the particle can have all energies, okay? Now, let's go back to phi, the time-dependent part, which is proportional to this. So it's minus E over H bar. Now, we're thinking of this particle moving as a wave, right? So, that means it has frequency and it has wavelength. The wavelength is determined by k. That's the wave number, 2 pi by lambda. Okay? And the frequency, again, is determined by energy because we, the energy of this wave, let us think of this wave as wave particles, similar to what we thought in the photon. E is h bar omega, where omega is the angular frequency. E is h 
mu and omega is 2 pi mu where mu is the linear frequency and h bar is h over 2 pi okay so what we can do is we can write e over h bar we can write it as omega which is the frequency of the particle wave so k has the lambda the wavelength and e and and the time dependent part has omega so this could be written as e minus i omega t so that is always the time dependent part of the wave fun wave function also if we have a reasonable problem then we can say that since if psi star or con complex conjugate of psi times psi is a probability distribution that is the probability of finding the particle in a certain region we can say that if we have a reasonable physical problem then the particle should exist exist somewhere in the space so if we have a particle and if you take all the space from x minus infinity to x plus infinity we should have the particle somewhere so the probability of having of finding the particle is one over the whole space so that means if psi complex conjugate times if psi dx over the whole space should be equal to one this is called the normalization condition so this is how we find the constants normalization condition of the wave function okay and this is how we find the constants if we have some constants like if you go back and look here we have this constant right we have the constant a how do we determine the constant a we invoke or we use this normalization condition such that this integral is equal to 1 and we using that we can get the normalization constant the time independent Schrodinger's equation so what so far what we discussed is Schrodinger equation in one dimension which is the x along the x-axis okay but if we have a three-dimensional problem then we have to write Schrodinger equation in three dimensions so things like Delta by Delta X which is only in the X direction goes to Napla which is a three-dimensional operator right and what it is it is Delta by Delta X along I plus Delta by Delta Y along J plus Delta by Delta Z along K so it's a three-dimensional operator that replaces Delta by Delta X also x which is the position of the particle goes to position in three dimensional space which is r and r is equal to xi plus yj plus zk so it's a three dimensional space or three dimensional representation so that is why we have r so the time independent Schrodinger equation which was you know in one dimension was h bar squared by 2m okay delta squared by psi by delta x squared remember that plus u of x 
u of x psi equals e of psi. And this if psi is if psi of x, of course, you know, one dimension. Okay? So that's our one dimension problem. Now, this becomes the delta or nabla operator squared. And if psi becomes if psi of r instead of if psi of x. And u, instead of only u of x, it becomes u of r. Okay? And this nabla squared is actually div, right? A div operator, which is uh, uh, nabla dot nabla. So it will be delta squared of, over delta x squared plus delta squared by delta y squared plus delta squared by delta z squared. And however, the time independent part it still remains the same e minus i e over h bar t. But now, you have to solve for the position dependent part, a uh, part which is the psi of r in three dimensions. Now, what in all applications that we need to use here, we will only use the one dimensional case. It's good enough for us, but uh, if you need, you know, to solve a three dimensional problem, then that is how we handle a three dimensional problem. So now, you know, this is uh, somewhat uh, heavy material, so I will stop here, and uh, uh, next time we will continue uh, from this point onward to see some examples of applying quantum mechanics to some specific problems, and these specific problems will have an impact on uh, some electronic devices or nanoscale devices uh, in, in electronics or in solid state electronics. So uh, today I, I will stop here and in the next lecture I'll continue from this.